Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is episode 28, Children's Sci-Fi During the New Wave. I first talked about children's science fiction books in episode 14, the first episode about Robert Heinlein. But I also mentioned how it didn't quite mean the same thing it does today. My go-to source for an outside perspective on this is Farah Mendelssohn, author of the 2009 review of children's sci-fi, The Intergalactic Playground. Mendelssohn has elsewhere noted a shift in the genre starting around 1970, from established sci-fi authors writing children's lit, like Heinlein, to children's authors writing sci-fi. And she suggests that this was to the detriment of quality science fiction stories. There's some truth to this, especially in that Heinlein is historically the exception rather than the rule being known for both children's sci-fi and adult sci-fi. But I'm not sure I agree on the general point. After all, this era was the new wave, when the trend in the genre was toward softer science fiction and more character-driven stories. So it's only natural that there was a corresponding shift in children's lit at the same time. However, I also think it's more complicated than that, because the well-known examples of children's sci-fi are much sparser than adult sci-fi. One of the reasons I want an outside perspective is that when it comes to children's books, I'm worried that I'm biased toward focusing on books published from the 1990s onward. In other words, the ones I read myself as a kid. I've tried really hard to compensate for this, and I think that trend is real. The genre really did pick up in the 90s and 2000s. I'll talk more about that when we get to those episodes. Still, the fact remains that the list of well-known children's sci-fi books in the 60s and 70s is short, making it hard to see long-term trends. The other piece of this puzzle, and maybe the reason that list is so short, is that children's books on average don't seem to have the same staying power as adult books. Certainly there are classics like A Wrinkle in Time that keep on going, but they're much more subject to the fads of the day. A large fraction of the books that the tail end of Gen Z is reading today, sci-fi books at least, are not the same books that millennials like me read as kids, which are not the same books that Gen X read, which to a degree are not the same books that the baby boomers read, although those are much closer. And many of these older books, like Asimov's Lucky Star series, are out of print today, whereas his and his contemporaries' adult novels remain the cornerstone of the genre. It takes a bit of detective work to get the whole story on this topic, but I think I have a clear picture of at least the starting point. Farrah Mendelssohn identifies Heinlein and Andre Norton as basically being the faces of children's sci-fi in the 50s and 60s. They are the authors the baby boomers were reading, to the extent that the boomers were reading children's lit at all. Many sci-fi fans of that generation started with now classics like iRobot, Dune, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. Even so, Mendelssohn claims that Heinlein and Norton were the gold standard for children's lit not just in the 50s and 60s, but all the way into the 70s and even the 80s. In other words, Gen X was reading the same books the boomers were, with the caveat that there were some important new ones that came out over that time. And really, there were others even in the 50s. Lucky Star, the Tom Swift Jr. books, and I realized after the fact that I had missed a notable title from that decade in the previous Heinlein episode. The Wonderful Flight to the Mushroom Planet by Eleanor Cameron from 1954. However, this is another book like Lucky Star that is frequently found on lists of recommendations, but is not widely available in practice. It's not on Audible nor Kindle, so while it's still kind of in print, I think we can move on from that one. Of the two big-name authors, Heinlein, of course, wrote boys' books in the vein of The Hardy Boys, except sci-fi instead of mysteries, with the goal of inspiring interest in STEM careers and civic responsibility. And as Mendelssohn observed, he wasn't your typical children's writer, being even more well-known for adult sci-fi. As for the second member of this pair, Andre Norton was a children's writer, and not even exclusively in sci-fi. Andre Norton was the pen name most frequently used by Alice Mary Norton, and in fact she legally changed her name to Andre Alice Norton at the start of her writing career in 1934. 
Her reason for doing this was much the same reason J.K. Rowling wrote under her initials. She wanted to be a fantasy writer, and at that time, the primary market for fantasy was to boys, who allegedly prefer male authors. Norton initially wanted to be a school teacher, but due to the Great Depression ended up becoming a librarian. After many years of this, she had to leave due to ill health. She worked at a publishing house for a while until finally, at age 46, she quit to become a full-time writer. And then her career really took off. Though she had written 21 books up to that point, after that she wrote over 150, continuing all the way to her death in 2005 at age 93. Norton wrote a variety of genres, including crime fiction, romance, and historical fiction, in addition to her initial fantasy writing. She wrote her first sci-fi novel, Starman's Son 2250 AD, in 1952, which really sounds like a pulp title. She was nominated for the Hugo Award for her 1963 science fantasy novel Witch World, which kicked off her longest-running series. Witch World tells the tale of Simon Tregarth, a World War II veteran on the run from criminals who is given the opportunity to escape to a parallel universe where he finds himself in a medieval fantasy world where he must help a nation of witches fight against a mysterious and powerful enemy. Which, honestly, also sounds like pulp fiction. There are definite elements of A Princess of Mars in there. I think there's more leeway for things like that in children's lit, at least historically. Norton also received Kirkus starred reviews for three other science fiction books, Key Out of Time, Night of Masks, and Moon of Three Rings. But in all honesty, I'd never heard of any of her books, except perhaps vaguely in passing. They weren't in my experience at all by the time I was growing up. Granted, Heinlein's juveniles weren't either, but Norton's books are just not something I've encountered as a sci-fi buff. Now, I would posit that the most popular children's sci-fi book written from 1945 all the way to 1990 is A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Lengo. There are several others that are well known, but not on that level. And since it came early in the new wave in 1962, it might well be the pivot that brought children's sci-fi into the new wave. A Wrinkle in Time is also a rare example of overtly Christian science fiction. Frequently mentioned alongside the Chronicles of Narnia as prime Christian children's lit. But there's an interesting difference. I've written before that A Wrinkle in Time is at the same time more explicit and more subtle in its religious message than Narnia. The reason is that Lewis's writings could be read as pure allegory. Aslan could be a literary Christ figure rather than literally Jesus. The biblical God and biblical references are never directly mentioned in Narnia. Meanwhile, Lengel openly quotes the Bible in A Wrinkle in Time, and specifically describes the three quote-unquote witches as guardian angels. But she wasn't trying to write an allegory, nor make doctrinal points, where Lewis was doing both. She was simply telling a good story within a Christian worldview. That story centers around 13-year-old Meg Murray, her friend Calvin, and her little brother Charles Wallace, who was a child prodigy and seems to have strange mental abilities. Meg and Charles Wallace are the children of two Nobel Prize-winning scientists, but their father disappeared some years ago. One day, they are whisked away by the three angels to rescue their father, who fell through a tesseract, that is, a wrinkle in time, and wound up imprisoned on another planet. And if it's a tesseract, it should really be a wrinkle in space, but maybe that didn't sound as good. They land on the planet Kamazots, which has been conquered by the spiritual forces of evil in the form of IT, both letters capitalized, a disembodied brain that controls the minds of everyone on the planet to force them into perfect conformity. Being that this was 1962, there are some definite anti-communist themes there, but Lengel's intended meaning seems to have been about totalitarian regimes more broadly. And A Wrinkle in Time, of course, was part of Lengel's Time Quintet, followed by four other books about the Murray family, A Wind in the Door, A Swiftly Tilting Planet, Many Waters, and An Acceptable Time. <laughs> 
This is an odd series because there's actually very little connection between the books. And it's not that it's an episodic series like Tom Swift, where there's basically no continuity. It's more like Arthur C. Clarke's variations on a theme notion in the Space Odyssey series. Each book in the Time Quintet has only a handful of scattered references to the earlier ones, at least somewhat different world building, and, if you try to work it out, a different timeline. And yet there is still a definite continuity to them. A Wind in the Door takes place a couple years after A Wrinkle in Time, where Meg is contacted by more aliens, recruited to a new spiritual battle, and is again forced to confront her own flaws in order to save Charles Wallace from a spiritually inflicted disease. It's still a pretty good story, but I found it a little jarring how different it was. A Swiftly Tilting Planet focuses on a now teenage Charles Wallace, who travels through time with the help of a unicorn, to prevent a South American dictator from starting a nuclear war by changing his ancestry. It gets weird. To be honest, I didn't like A Swiftly Tilting Planet. I thought the messaging was really problematic and inconsistent with Lengel's Christian views. She goes deep into Sins of the Father's territory in a way that made me uncomfortable and seems out of place with the rest of the series. I can't find very many people online who seem to notice this, but I just couldn't get past it. Also, kind of weird that any scientist, no matter how brilliant, would get a personal phone call from the president warning him that a nuclear war is imminent when he can't do anything about it. Anyway, next up, Many Waters is about Meg's and Charles Wallace's twin brothers, Dennis and Sandy, who are accidentally thrown back in time to the days just before Noah's flood, the only one of the books that ties in with biblical stories directly. In contrast with the earlier books, which focus wholly or partly on Meg, Many Waters is very much aimed at teenage boys, and discusses issues that will be most relevant to them. Age-appropriate, of course, but surprisingly frank. Although, fair warning, modern readers may not like the portrayal of women at several points. And it does also use the spurious racial tradition about Noah's sons, but not in a negative way. Finally, an Acceptable Time is about Meg's daughter, Polyhymnia, yes, really, who winds up traveling back and forth to ancient North America and winds up in the middle of a Native American war. Actually, that's another point. Both A Swiftly Tilting Planet and An Acceptable Time are, let's say, dated in their portrayal of Native Americans. I'd still recommend them, but modern readers will want to be aware that the series was a product of its time. Interestingly, the original A Wrinkle in Time has aged the best, in my opinion, and is the most clearly sci-fi of the bunch. There's a reason it's a classic. There are a few other titles from this period worth mentioning. The Iron Giant by Ted Hughes is notable for being one of the very few sci-fi books aimed at younger, early elementary kids. Though it's known today for the 1999 cult classic animated film adaptation. I should note that the original title of the book was The Iron Man, which is still used in Hughes's native Britain. But it was and still is published as The Iron Giant in the United States, with the character's name within the book also changed, to avoid confusion with the superhero Iron Man. This practice was continued in the movie, which is why I prefer The Iron Giant title. Anyway, the book is definitely meant for younger readers. As you can see from the subtitle, a children's story in five nights. Also from the fact that the movie is 12 minutes longer than the audiobook, although the movie was a very loose adaptation to start with. Either way, it's just five chapters describing the alien robot's arrival on Earth, his capture by humans, befriending the boy Hogarth, and finally, his fight with the monstrous space bat angel dragon, which was not in the movie. Perfect for beginning readers. Around the same time as Hughes's book, another British author, John Christopher, also known for The Death of Grass, wrote the Tripods Trilogy. I confess I'd never heard of this series before I started this podcast, but it's fairly prominent and has actually enjoyed significant popularity in reprints in recent years. A sort of spiritual successor to The War of the Worlds, The Tripods follows a teenaged boy named Will Parker and his friends, as they fight against the mysterious alien tripods that have conquered the world. 
basically, it was a young adult dystopia before it was cool. And I'd say it's worth a look. And of course, I have to mention Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim by Robert C. O'Brien. After A Wrinkle in Time and The Little Prince, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim is probably the next most likely of these books to be read in schools, probably because it was one of the few examples to win a Newbery Medal, along with, again, A Wrinkle in Time. Mrs. Frisbee is a mouse who is looking for help for her sick child and becomes mixed up with a group of lab rats from the National Institute of Mental Health, which had experimented on them and accidentally made them smart enough to escape their cages and build a mechanized society on a farm. She also learns that her deceased husband was a lab mouse from the same experiment, and helps the rats escape to a more distant home where they can be free from human interference. For the record, the movie adaptation The Secret of Nim changed the name Frisbee to Brisbee with a B to differentiate it from the toy Frisbee, which is spelled differently but sounds the same. There are more books than these, of course, but other authors in this category are not nearly as notable. Roald Dahl did write Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator as a sequel to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, a surprisingly well-researched story where Willy Wonka and company go to space in the glass elevator. But that was a one-off divergence from Dahl's usual weird fantasy. Alexander Key shows up several times on lists of children's sci-fi books, however he's really known for just one in particular, Escape to Witch Mountain, which itself is probably known less in its own right and more because Disney made it into a movie three times. I guess they really liked the story. Another name that shows up quite a bit on these lists is William Sleetor, who wrote many children's sci-fi and horror books starting in the 1970s, the most famous probably being The Boy Who Reversed Himself. He's also notable for being one of R.L. Stein's inspirations, but again, not nearly as notable today as the others. And technically Ender's Game was also aimed at younger audiences, but that's a story for another episode. And that's really about it, looking at the science fiction that was read by the baby boomers and, to some extent, the Gen Xers. Children's sci-fi had diversified some over that time period, and had produced some major classic titles, but I feel like it hadn't really come into its own yet. Ditto for other mediums like television. There were some specifically children's shows, Jetsons, Thunderbirds, Johnny Quest, but that also seems to be something that ramped up more in the 80s and 90s. I've actually got a lot more to say with regard to the books, about things like reading levels, recommendation lists, and generally how I compiled my short and long lists of titles for children's sci-fi. But I'm going to hold off on that until we get to the 90s, because most of it is more relevant to that time period. For now, suffice to say that I tried hard to identify the most important titles from this time period without missing any. It's possible I still did, but I think I hit the main points. But before I sign off, I should probably mention one more thing that is closely tied with children's lit. Comic books. The 60s were an interesting time in comics, and to my eye, they also tie in with the new wave. At this time, DC Comics, the home of Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, had been around since the 30s. And while they fell on hard times for a while when the Comics Code Authority came along in 1954, they were still going strong. But here's the thing you'll notice about DC Comics. If you look at Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, and their colleagues, especially in their Golden Age and Silver Age incarnations, they're all paragons of goodness. They're confident, good-looking, unfailingly righteous, and generally have it all put together. Then along came Marvel Comics. They were a previously existing company under the name Atlas Comics, but they transitioned to Marvel Comics in 1961 under the writership of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, who introduced the Fantastic Four. And right away, these were a different kind of superhero. They didn't wear masks, but lived openly as celebrities instead. One of them was even a hero who looked like a villainous monster. And they argued with each other, they had vices, they held grudges. In short, they were human, in spite of their powers. The world of Marvel Comics was more real, too. The Fantastic Four didn't live in Metropolis or Gotham. They lived in New York. And they dealt with real-world issues. They didn't fight mad scientists or deranged lunatics with improbable amounts of power. 
Not all the time, anyway. Marvel's heroes would fight communist agents, and later the Viet Cong, when DC wouldn't touch the stuff. It was all the things a comic book was supposed to not be, and it was a great success. Then along came Spider-Man and the X-Men, who were teenage heroes dealing with teenage problems. And in the case of the X-Men, an obvious allegory for the civil rights movement. Once again, they were wildly successful. All of this was done, at least in part, to make the comics appeal to older readers. Still mostly kids and teenagers, but older. And in dealing with more serious real-world issues, both personal and global, it's a much more new wave perspective than DC, which was still following in the footsteps of the pulp era. And on that note, we are actually finished with our discussion of the new wave movement. As we've seen, the new themes it brought into the genre didn't go away at the end of the 60s, but they were balanced by a resurgence of hard sci-fi, and still more new ideas that came along with it. And moving forward, it's time to look at those new trends that came about in the 70s. There's plenty more history still to come. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is available on all the major podcasting platforms you know the drill by now. You can find it and my other video work on YouTube. Expect some more content there once I get my primary computer fixed. And you can find all of my writings at sciencemeetsfiction.com. My book recommendation for this episode? Well, I have to go with A Wrinkle in Time. It's THE classic. However, I will make an addendum to that. For younger kids, I'd go with The Iron Giant especially because I frequently see A Wrinkle in Time listed as upper middle grade, something of more relevance to pre-teens. I was going to try to go deeper and break it down by reading level or something, but again, more relevant when we get to the 90s, so I'll leave it at those two for now. Next time on a very special episode... Wait, no, wrong genre. But in all seriousness, next time I will be doing a very special interview. For the first time on this podcast, I will be interviewing a professional historian who studies the history of science fiction. Dr. Benjamin Stevens is a visiting professor of classical studies at Trinity University, who specializes in ancient literature and the Greco-Roman tradition in science fiction and fantasy. So be sure to check it out and learn how people who do this stuff for a living see the genre. Thanks for listening.